It's working. Well, I don't think it's working. Okay, I don't think they'll be able to hear me. So just go ahead and introduce yourself, and and um and then I'll just ask the question. I guess if you could put me on speaker near the thing. Yeah, I have um, you. I have you on speaker right near the thing, so that okay. should work. All right. So if you want to just introduce yourself and a little bit about your background, and then we'll kind of talk. We'll kind of. I'll start the interview question. Okay. Great. Um, hi, this is Deborah O. Cooper from, um, from San Francisco, and I am a therapist and an activist and an artist, and I live in San Francisco, and i um, 61 years old, and as I was, a, I was an activist actually from a pretty, pretty early age in high school, it was the, um, it was, I was, 15 in 1970 so I went through the 60s watching Vietnam on television and the civil rights movement and um, I probably the the thing I got most excited about early in, in my as a teenager was um, feminism and um, the early 70s was a really incredible time of activism for feminists and I was part of um, anti-violence work and starting a rape crisis team and a shelter home. And out of that work, I became a therapist. And um, I've been involved in the environmental movement and in the last um, last 10 years in the um, uh, queer queer rights, I'd say, LGBT, LMNOP, all those those uh, letters, um, rights. So, um, um, so that's that's uh, basically my history. Um, other questions, Deanna? Okay. Well, as you say, there's lots more history, but we won't share that on here. <laughs> we won't uh, share. If they can hear me. Yeah. If they can hear me, I remember you coming home from. You told our parents you were at a field trip, and you actually came home. You got tear gas, and they saw it on the news. That so, was pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, I think it was around Nixon. But anyway. Oh yeah, so anti-war. No, definitely, yeah. and definitely part of yeah. anti-war in high school, and um, yeah, I got tear gassed. I've been tear gassed many, many times at this point. Um, I was part of organizing um, against the uh, World Trade Organization in Seattle. There's a movie about it with Charlize Theron. She's not playing me, um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, I there's a long, I have a long yeah. history in doing civil disobedience and. Um, um, and I actually yeah. trained people for many years on doing nonviolent uh, civil disobedience. And I love that you kind of, you know, as you've turned into the maven of activism, that you like to joke about, like, you're, like, hearing your purse to, uh, to uh, protests and things like that. It's just, it's just kind of a developmental cycle we go through. And I just think that's a good description of, you know, you know you've been doing it a long time when you now carry your purse with you. And, yeah, yeah, and, um, yeah. Definitely. I mean, I think I really, really love that quote by Margaret Mead that says, never doubt that a small group of committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Because what I have seen in this lifetime is that it really just takes a, a, a small group of people organizing to um, come together and, and do something. And um, if you're, you know, if the time is right, there's that whole concept of the tipping point, and I think we've totally seen that with gay rights, um, that if, if the time is right, you can make incredible change. And what happened, um, this was, I think, two years ago, two and a half years ago, um, just a small group of us, I mean, there were, I think, five of us in um, meeting in one of our living rooms, and we were like, let's, let's, um, Let's see if we can get somebody to make a bill to make um, conversion therapy, which is uh, 
it isn't actually therapy at all. It's um, sexual orientation change efforts, as we called it, um, to try and, you know, basically send your kid to somebody who will try and make them straight. Um, let's try and make that illegal. <laughs> and we pitched it to several uh, Congress people, and one guy took it up. Um, and... But, we thought it would just educate. We thought it'd be like we get in the new, you know, get stuff in the news, and and but we never actually thought it would pass. But it passed, and we were the first. California was the first state in the country to um, to to ban that with minors, and it spread, and it, it and it's spreading, and now it's spreading actually across the world. And um, you know, it used to be a big, big, uh, you know industry this the the things to um an industry to you know send your kids to these camps and to these therapists that would basically shame you and and make make you straight and they're go, they're uh they're going out of business so well, that's good that's, that's fantastic business. and that um and share a little bit too because I'm, I'm trying to remember but i Oh yeah. Opposing. Oh yeah. What? Yeah, that was a whole other campaign. The uh, the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Um, when um, uh, Prop Eight, there was a. Now all of you students are growing up in a world where gay marriage is legalized. But um, we had a big, you know, we had a very bizarre night, in I guess it was two thousand eight when um, Obama was president. And Prop 8 passed, which which basically banned gay marriage in California. So um, when that happened, we went to we went to the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists. Um, actually, right before that happened, to get them to make a statement, and they wouldn't make a statement. Um, in they wouldn't make a state statement in favor of gay marriage, and so then a small group of us made all hell break loose, and. Um, and, and really made a campaign with that organization to come out for gay marriage. I mean, first they they gave the other side um, uh, equal space in the in the journal, this professional journal, which um, they had these crazy people from um, from even out of state who wrote how basically gay marriage promoted pedophilia and um, bestiality. I mean, just crazy homophobia. So. We ended up the whole that board got taken down. The, it turned out the head of the California Association of Marriage and Family Therapists was a Christian Christian counselor. So we we basically took that down, and it just took education. It takes media, um, but it really just a small group of people. When you notice something's wrong, can um, can make us think about it. It's International Women's Day. And Emmeline um, Pankhurst, oh, it said, who was a suffragette in London, um, in England, when women, uh, the turn of the last century, um, said, make noise. You've got to make noise. Uh -huh. So a big uh -huh. part of making change is making making noise. And I like, you know, one of my personal favorites is Robert Reich. They're, my students are actually going to watch Inequality for All. Um, oh, wonderful. Yeah, and he's just one of my favorites for so many reasons. But his is like make a ruckus. Yeah, I, I like that. It, it's one of those polite words our mother would approve of. Yeah, um, but it's but it is. It's like if something if something isn't okay, then then make noise. And so on that note, talk a little bit more about the um, when you were at the World Trade because that got there was things that got a lot of that press, sort of like the Occupy movement. Um, you know, things that happened in Oakland where. Um, you know, when people are angry, things happen. You can only kind of stifle that for a while. Um, and so there was, you've trained in a lot of nonviolence and peaceful protests. And then there was a lot of bad press about, you know, people breaking windows and things. So maybe talk on a larger level of how, when you're taking part in a, in a larger setting, how that, kind of the nonviolent part can get disrupted and kind of how you all 
from that, you know, from the we're nonviolent, how you all kind of try to prevent that, deal with that, and then speak out after the fact of, of, um, of this happening and the media paying a lot of attention to the negative parts. Oh, yeah. If the media, I mean, that's one thing you all just always have to know going in. If there, if there could be a thousand people getting re arrested um, nonviolently and really powerfully, you know, doing nonviolent actions. And if there's two people who are breaking windows, they're going to get the they're going to get the press. And, you know, I think that's, you know, there's that line, I think, from the civil rights movement, which is keep your eyes on the prize. So you just have to keep going. And, you you know, that mm -hmm. that a thousand people getting arrested nonviolently or a thousand people doing something and keeping with it and not turning their focus to the two people who are breaking windows. That's what you got to do. I mean, I have watched so many people, you know, things, movements get disrupted by somebody being violent and everybody like focusing on that. And I just, just said, turn away. I mean, there's a whole, whole long history too of, um, of especially, you know, movements like Occupy and, um, you know, I, I would imagine it's even happening um, in Black Lives Matter that, that uh, and certainly happened in the Panthers in the, in the 70s, that there's, um, you know, that they send in people to agitate, you know, that are, uh, that with the government, the FBI did that. Um, and I think there's, you know, CIA, there's people who still do it. It's not just conspiracy theory, theory that people send in, you know, that, that people get uh, paid to make especially powerful, Im important movements look bad. Um, okay. And I think you just got, you can't pay attention, you, you have to just turn away from it. And, you know, the thing about, the thing about mass movements of, of nonviolent change is that the people in them change. Like, it, it's an incredible thing to, um, it's an eye-opening thing to, um, to get arrested, especially if you are a white person of privilege, um, you know, it's a, it's incredibly eye opening to realize what it's mm -hmm. like to actually, you know, uh, feel, feel like your humanity is kind of taken away and what it's like to be treated like a, a prisoner, um, to be okay. a prisoner. That's a, you know, I don't think that's the only way to make change, but I think it, it really is a radical, it's a radicalizing thing, you know, and I saw it with my niece and her friends um, uh, last year with the Black Lives Matter that that several of my niece's friends got, um, got arrested and they were, you know, they were absolutely <laughs> radicalized just from the experience. Oh, like they couldn't believe how they were treated. And you know these are pr pretty privileged kids from from um, from Berkeley. So, um, but when you're treated like that, then all of a sudden you you get it. Oh, you know what it's like to to you know be treated badly by the police. So, yeah. yeah. So okay, that's what you have. Such uh, it's amazing history. You have such good such good stories about it. So, Tell me a little bit about this. I remember we're going to be talking in the class. Uh, they're going to watch this probably tomorrow, either before or after class. So one of the things we're talking about is when people put a face on a on an issue, it makes a really big difference when you can humanize the issue and get past get past the the faulty belief systems or just challenge your belief systems and you know um, at least have be able to connect and so I have a clip with Bill Mayer I have to check it again to make sure but it's it's pretty funny but he's talking about people how they put a face on things and he uses like the, the um, one of the examples is Dick Cheney um, his daughter being being clear and being able to come come out and say you know I am for these rights which was very opposite of all a lot of other stances he took um, so kind of I remember you telling stories about police officers that actually, like, you felt empathy for them because they were put in a position of um, arresting you, and then you've also had these situations of being treated, like you said, in a very, you know, systematically not very humanistic manner. Um, so can you talk about that, like, putting a face on it? I remember you talking about a cop that was actually kind of apologizing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, that's, I mean... It, Mir There's a poet, Muriel Ruckhauser, who has a great, a great line in a poem that is, um, 
uh, the, wor the universe is not made of atoms, it's made of stories. And stories are what we respond.